friends, we uh, get to continue today working through uh, 1 Corinthians, and if you weren't here last week, you see the title for today's sermon, or am I this, you might be thinking, I might have missed something. And maybe uh, this uh, is kind of a continuation as we uh, move into chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, of what we were talking about last week, at the end of chapter 2. But we'll very quickly get up to speed as we, as we dig into this. But the, the idea, the theme that we're talking about today is a continuation from what we studied last week and what you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As Paul in this letter to the church of Corinth is, is really asking me these questions, getting into, and in this particular section, this idea on, I think we're still talking about human wisdom versus God's wisdom, and now we're talking about um, what people look like, what people act like. Are you a spiritual man or a natural man is the question that was asked last week. But those aren't the only options, as we'll see with what we cover today. There, there is there's another option for us to talk about. So that's where the or am I this comes into play. First Corinthians chapter three, verses one through seven. The scripture says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. For you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. For you are still fleshly. For since, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of, of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to, to be able to continue studying this, this letter, this great letter um, to the church of Corinth. And we know this is a letter to us. Father, we pray that as we study today that you'll give us insight and understanding help us to to determine am i a spiritual man am i a natural man or am i this type of person that we study today father our goal should be and i pray that our goal uh, for each person here is to be the spiritual man to be the one who is always growing in our understanding and reflection of you and I pray, Father, that if we find that we're something less than that, that we can make the steps that we need to that we need to make, take, do the things that we need to do, so that we can become that spiritual person, that spiritual man. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And so, as we, we dive into this, we'll, we'll kind of look at the the broad topic first, the, the, this broad idea, and and ask and answer this question of, of, of what in the world is this type of person that, that Paul is, is talking about here. And, and we ask the question, am I this? And the, the, the this that we're talking about today is not am I a spiritual man or not am I a natural man, but am I a spiritual man who's acting like a natural man? That, that's, that's, what, that's what he brings it down to in, in chapter 3, verse 1. He, the, now, there is there, there's some, a little bit of debate when people talk about the church of Corinth and who Paul is addressing here, is he really saying that these people aren't saved at all? So some, some read that into it and say, you know, these people are, aren't, aren't Christians at all. Some have the understanding when you talk about a carnal Christian that you're not even really talking about a Christian. But I think as we take apart, you don't even take, take apart a whole lot of what Paul is saying here. I think he, he has in mind that these people are Christians. They are Regenerate. He refers to them as brethren. And, and so I, I think that's a, that's a sure sign of, of how he considers them and how he is thinking of the people at Corinth. So we're talking about saved people. We're talking about regenerate people. We're talking about the spiritual man, to continue in the language that, that was introduced last week in chapter 2. We're talking about saved people, regenerate people, the spiritual people, the spiritual man who aren't acting like it. 
They're, they're not acting like it. They're, they're acting like, and he'll, and he'll dive further into this as we go along in our study today, but they're acting like fleshly people. They're acting like people who, who aren't saved. As he describes it, he'll talk about the, the spiritual infant it is what, we're, what they are acting like. And friends, i got to tell you, and I, this is probably just the first time I'll say this today. i probably say it a couple other times. I think that this is an issue that plagues God's church. It plagues God's church. This idea that there are people filling pews in, in churches across the world that are spiritual infants, that are spiritual men acting like natural men, spiritual people who are still just caught up, caught up and acting like they always used to act. Spiritual people who are, who are still just uh, pursuing the things of the flesh and not acting as spiritual people. This plagues God's church. Plagues people who, who, who yes, are, are, are actually saved, but have never shown any growth. And, and, this, and, and the reason I say this is a plague is that this is why, this is what gives churches bad reputations. This is why, you know, people say, I'm, I'm never going to that church again or this church again because they've heard or they, they've seen, they've experienced people in the church who, by all accounts, have been Christians for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long it is, acting like they're no different than anyone out there. And they've seen this and this is what bugs people more than anything, probably. They've seen this kind of behavior, not just out there, but in here. Inside, inside the walls of your church building or in, in, the, in, in, the, in the course of, of church life. People, natural men, unsaved people, unregenerate people, have seen supposedly saved people, regenerate people, acting just like them. And so they then make the conclusion, and it's... Not a bad conclusion. Why would I go to church every week to act like that? Why would I commit to this if this is what the, if, if I'm going to end up like you? If I'm not going to really be changed, you talk about why would I do that? And so this is why I, it, it's an issue that plagues the church because it's rampant. It's rampant, and it's an issue that threatens the church because of the impact that that it has. And so, as, as, as we're, we're, we'll dig into deeper what it looks like, because that's what Paul does here. He, he kind of introduces the idea and makes the statement, you're, you're, you're saved, but you're not acting like it. And then he goes into why and how it looks. Okay? And so, that, that's what we're going to do here. We're, we're going we're gonna to dig into this idea that, okay, you're saved, but you're not acting like it. And, and as I thought about this, I thought about that big old school that's being built just down the street here. You know, if, if you haven't been by to see it, just, when you leave church today, just head down New Beth, about two miles, and take a look at it. It's, it's an amazing thing. Amazing thing. But, you know, the fact is, we know it's a school. It's a school, isn't it? It's a school building. If you go see it, you see buildings, you see a football field, you see all this stuff. It, it's still being completed. But it's a school. It's a school. But it has no people in it yet. It has no students. It has no teachers. It has no cafeteria workers. It has no buses. It has none. Of it. It, it's, it's a school, but it's not acting like a school yet. It's not doing the things that a school does. And that's kind of a, a, an understanding of, of what Paul is saying about the church of Corinth. Your church and your saved people but you're not doing the things that saved people ought to be doing. You're not acting the way that saved people ought to be acting. You're acting like you're not saved. And in particular, he says you're acting like spiritual babies. Spiritual babies. He says at the end of verse 1, um, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. He says they are infants in Christ. Now let me tell you this. There's nothing wrong with being an infant in Christ. There's nothing wrong with being a spiritual baby. 
if indeed you're supposed to be a spiritual baby. If, you're, if, if you've just been saved, if you've just uh, surrendered your life to the Lord, if, if this is something that's taken place recently, if this is something that's taken place in the last year or two, if there's nothing wrong with being a spiritual infant. That, that's, not what he's, that's not what he's getting at here. And, and so we can't walk away from here thinking, well, gosh, you know, I've, I've been saved a few months and I'm a spiritual baby and, 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 and that's wrong. No, that's not wrong. And that's not who he's talking to. And that's not who we're talking to here. We're not, we're not talking to the person who really is a spiritual baby. We're not talking to that person. And, and clearly, that, that's not what he has in mind here. Because there's an implication that he's talking to people who should not be spiritual infants in this point, at this point in their walk with the Lord. They should not still be acting as spiritual infants. And so that's who we're talking about. That, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're getting at here. The idea is that I have to speak, Paul is saying, I have to speak to you, I have to treat you like spiritual infants, and that's not where you should be. That's not how I should be talking to you at this point. But you're acting like spiritual infants. You should be growing and maturing by now. This is the this is the person that he's talking. The person he's talking to is the person who's who's been a Christian in, in our context. You've been a Christian for years, but you still cry and whine and complain like a baby. You're still acting like a baby. And in terms of what we're talking about today, what it means is maybe not that you literally cry and whine and complain. Or maybe it does mean that in some cases. But, but, but that you are constrained by the, by, by the thinking of the world. You're not, you're not thinking and approaching things with spiritual wisdom and discernment. But you're thinking and approaching things as a baby does. Remember last week we talked about the, the spiritual man spiritually appraises all things. This means that you should be doing that at this point. But you're not. Is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying you should be able to spiritually appraise all things. Everything that comes across in your life. Not just at church. But, but all these things that, 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 come, that come up and happen in your life. Maybe there's some, some, some incident with a person at work. Maybe there's something that, that happens in your family. Maybe, maybe as a natural man you would think this person crossed me. This person has done me wrong. But as a spiritually maturing Christian, you should, you should be appraising this spiritually and thinking, well, what's behind this person acting like this? What may be going on in this person's life that caused them to treat me this way? How can I, how can I approach this person to help them through this, even though they have just wronged me? You see, it doesn't mean that, that I don't understand that maybe I got wronged by somebody. That they treated me wrong, treated me bad. But the spiritually maturing person is going to say, why did they do that? And how can I help them to overcome this? How can I use this as, as, a, as a teaching opportunity? How can I use this as a witnessing opportunity? Maybe this, or as a, as a growth opportunity. Maybe this person who's wronged me is not a Christian. And so I can use it as a witnessing opportunity. Maybe this person who's wronged me or said something wrong is, 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 is a baby Christian. And I can use this as a discipling opportunity, a mentoring opportunity, an opportunity to help this person grow. But if I'm not appraising it spiritually, if I'm not acting like a, a spiritually mature person that I should be, guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get mad at you because you're wrong. And, 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 these, and that's an example of, of what he's talking about here when he's talking about a, a spiritual baby. Because, you know, a baby, what does a baby know? Baby doesn't know anything, but to you know, if they're hungry, they're gonna cry, and it's and you know, for them, it might not, it might not be saying anything other than I'm hungry. But for us, we hear it. We're like, what's wrong with this kid? They're wet and they cry. What's wrong with this kid? All they ever do is cry. It may seem at times. And you know, as I thought about this, I thought about you know, one of, one of the marks of the spiritual babe. Is, is that the spiritual baby tries to control things. And you think, well, does a baby really try? Man, a, a baby is probably the best controller there is. You think 
about that. An infant just control. You hear, you hear an infant cry and you're moving. You hear a whimper and you're moving. Right? You, you just, you're just you responding to it. And, and spiritual, spiritual babies then know that, know that to be the case. And they know that if they cry loud, loud enough or whine loud enough or complain loud enough that they can control you possibly. And that's what spiritual babies do. But then also on the flip side of what we're talking about today is how does the spiritually mature person respond to that spiritual baby, to that spiritual infant? And part of the issue, part of the problem is that sometimes even as a spiritually mature person, guess what you and I can get pulled into acting like? A spiritual baby. Sometimes, even though I am spiritually mature, you are spiritually mature, sometimes I can get pulled back into acting like a baby because a spiritual baby got at me. And, and, and I get in a tit for tat with them when our response should be as a spiritually mature person to see how I can help this spiritual baby to grow and mature. Okay? Now, he, Paul continues talking about the spiritual infant and, and he, gives, he gives some of the marks, some of the in, in, indication of the spiritual baby. And, and, and he talks about the idea that he's not eating solid food. In, in verse 2 he says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. And so Paul says, listen, when you were spiritual babies, when you were spiritual infants, guess what I fed you? I fed you milk. I, I, I fed you stuff that was, that was easy to digest. You didn't have teeth yet. You couldn't eat meat, so I gave you milk. I, I, I introduced the word of God to you. I, I introduced the gospel to you in a way that you could digest. And that was good then. He says... But now I'm still having to do that when you should be eating some meat. When I should be able to go a bit deeper with you into the Word. When I should be able to go a little bit deeper into some of these ideas and thoughts. I still have to give you milk. And we're still in the same place, he said. Perhaps the idea for us is that Warren Wiersbe said, and, and, and thinking about the, the spiritual babe having milk instead of meat, when, when we're stuck in that place, we desire Bible stories versus Bible doctrine. You know, we, we're, we're, we're caught up in, in, into knowing about Jonah and the big fish. And, and how, man, what a cool story. He got swallowed by this, by this big fish and he was in his belly for three days. You see, the spiritual baby can know that. The spiritual babe, the, <laughs> the, the, the spiritual babe can, can know these, these, these Bible stories. You can know the facts of it, you can know the figures, you can know, you can even recite maybe the books of the Bible. You can say that there's 37 Old Testament books or however many it is and however many New Testaments it is. You can, you can say all this stuff. You, you, can, you can say some of these things. You can talk about Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days. And that's all you want to know. That's what you want to focus on. But what Paul is saying to the Corinthians and, and, and by application and by extension to us is that there comes a point when you should be moving beyond knowing the, knowing the facts of the story and getting into why. Why was Jonah in the belly of this fish for three days? Why was he there? Why was there this, this storm? Why was he thrown overboard? Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? You, you, know, you get to this place where you should want to know these things. Know why is it? And what is the implication for me? How does this apply to me? You should, there's a point where you should be able to, to look into the scriptures and, and, and look beyond the, the wonderful things that we read and hear and know about what, what great entertainment and what great reading it is and move to this place of how does it impact my life and how can it impact someone else's life and what is the implication 
for the future? What is the implication for our world today when, when I read this and when I read that? Go beyond the story and dig into doctrine. We've talked before about the fact that, that for many of us, I, and I was this way, and, 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 and probably shared with many, that if you grew up in church, it took a while before you started, you know, you'd read something, say, hey, this is what Sunday school will be about today. In my adult class, oh yeah, I remember reading about that when I was nine and when I was 10. And you don't go any deeper into it. You still think of it the way you thought of it when you were 10 years old. Oh, I know this story. And you've never dug any deeper to see how it applies to you today. This is, this is a spiritual infant. If you're, if you're approaching the scriptures this way, and you shouldn't be at this point. Okay? And, and guys, I want you to know, this has nothing to do with how old you are. Okay? If you're 70 years old and you just became a Christian last week, you're a spiritual infant. You're a spiritual infant. If you're 70 years old and you became a Christian 60 years ago, but you haven't progressed to thinking of doctrine instead of stories, you're a spiritual infant. It's who you are. If you're 20 years old, but man, you're digging into doctrine and you're, you're, you're digging into the things of the Lord and you're growing, then you're, you're spiritually maturing. You're not an infant. Okay, it has nothing to do with your chronological age, with your birth age, your birth date, but it has to do with how you're growing in the Lord. Does doctrine matter to you? Are you digging into the deep things of the Word? Whereas he also says that the spiritual infant is concerned more about entertainment than edification. You're concerned more about, do, 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 do you come to church looking for the choir to give a great special, looking for uh, the, the band, the praise band, and, and, the, and the piano to have some rousing music that really gets you in the mood, get some goosebumps going, and, and boy, you're like, man, the spirit was moving today. There was this great music. What the preacher taught us? I don't know. But the spirit was moving. The music was great. I was entertained. Or do you come to church thinking, all right, preacher, make something happen today. Give me something good today. Or do you leave thinking, man, the preacher was off today. Preacher, you know, listen, I don't know. I don't know what we got from him today. You know, do you come every week thinking that the preacher has to hit a home run for you to get something out of it? Guys, I can tell you, preacher ain't going to hit a home run every week. Not going to happen. I've told people, well, hope, hopefully I at least get a single. Well, maybe I won't. Maybe sometimes I get hit by the pitch. But at least i got to get on base, right? That's, that's what we're hoping for, at least week after week. But, you see, the, the spiritual infant is always looking for someone else to do it for. The spiritual infant is, is looking, when they come to a worship service, they're looking for all these other factors to, to make it so that they can feel like they got something out of it today. The spiritually maturing person is going to approach it differently. The spiritually maturing person is going to say, God, the spiritually maturing person might just even pray before they come. The spiritually maturing person might just prepare spiritually before they come to worship. The spiritually maturing person might have spent the past week thinking about what we talked about last Sunday, reading, studying, praying, Studying other stuff, going to a small group Bible study, be it here on Wednesday or somewhere else, some other time of the week. Growing deeper in the Word and saying, Lord, I am praying in anticipation of what I will learn from you next week. I am, I am thankful for what I've learned. I am thankful for what you're doing through your scripture in my life. I am grateful for this. And Father, I anticipate that when I go today, whether the preacher hits a home run or a single or whether he strikes out, that the reading of your word is moving in me, that I'm allowing your Holy Spirit who is living in me to do his work no matter what I hear from that preacher. No matter if the choir sings or not. No matter if we sing hymns or a contemporary song. No matter what. No matter if it's in your wheelhouse, what we sing or what we read or what, we, what you hear. Or no matter if it's, man, you know, I, I just don't know. I'm not concerned. It's 
say, God, how will you use this to change me today? And how can I use this to give you glory? <clears throat> you see, the spiritually maturing person recognizes that coming to worship is not primarily about you. What do we call it? Tell me, what do we call it? <coughs> we call it worship. No, I'm going to ask you to verbally answer again. Who do we worship? God. When we come expecting something to happen to us, who are we worshiping? Self. Me. Us, right? That's who we are worshiping. Just spiritually, and, and see, a spiritual babe, a spiritual infant, it's okay to think that. Because you have to learn. It's okay on some level to think that. All right? That quickly has to go away. But it, it's kind of natural that the spiritual infant may start out thinking that way. Because all your life, that's what you thought, that it's about me. Right? You cry for food when you're hungry. You cry for a diaper change when you're wet. It's all about me. That's what an infant does. And so as a spiritual infant, you've got you to gotta learn that it, 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 it turns into something different. That it's not about you anymore, but it's about God. It's about God. And, and, and so that's the, the, the process of moving from, from milk to meat in our lives is moving from this idea of stories to doctrine and this idea of moving from entertainment to edification. How, how God, are you using this to build me and mold me and shape me and grow me so that I can serve and worship you and give you the glory? It, it, it impacts our approach. How? This, and so this is one of the questions, one of the application questions and examination questions for, for every one of us here today. How am I approaching worship? Not that worship is the only measure of your spiritual growth, but it's one of the measures. How am I approaching it? How am I approaching Bible study? Is it about me? Or is it about him? Is it about stories, a doctrine, entertainment, or edification? It's, we, we, we've got to consider that. Here, here, here's another a mark of, of spiritual infancy is that we're, we're manipulated by the flesh. Manipulated by the flesh. Verse 3. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? He's saying, listen, the spiritual infant, which the Corinthians he's calling out, saying that you are at this point, and that's left for you and I to examine among ourselves, the spiritual infant is manipulated by the flesh. You're still acting as though you're under the control of the flesh. We, we've talked about this. We still say, I just can't help it. I sin because I just can't help it. I sin because God made me. We even try to blame God. Right? God made me this way. There's nothing I can do. Look at me. I'm caught in a straitjacket. I can't believe I got it. I, I, I just... This, this, is, this is who I am. And, and, and that's, that's not biblical. That, that's a scheme employed of the enemy. That, that, that's, a, that's a scheme of Satan. That, that, that's, that's Satan getting out. And that's why I call this, that's why I said on, on this particular point that it's manipulation. Manip, manipulated by the flesh, and the flesh is controlled by Satan and his demons. That this is how he tries to, to get at us. And it is manipulation. Because as a redeemed person, be it spiritual infant or spiritually mature, guess what? You're no longer under his control. You, you no longer have to capitulate to be manipulated by the enemy. You don't have to give in to it. You don't have to act as if there is no choice because there is a choice. And that's the fact that you and I choose. We choose to go after jealousy and strife. That's what Paul says. That's the issue that he's addressing right here with the Corinthians. He says, listen, you're manipulated by the flesh. Just look at the jealousy and strife that exists among you. You're controlled by the flesh. You're controlled still by, by your natural thoughts, who you used to be. Just look at the jealousy and divisions among you, as he'll talk about in a minute, and, and even as he talked about, alluded to in chapter 1. You're controlled by the flesh because you're still jealous about whose camp you're in. I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos. 
And you're divided even over this. Later on in Corinthians, we'll see, once we get to about chapter 12, we'll see that they're, they're manipulated by the flesh and they're flaunting of their spiritual gifts. Paul addresses this idea that, hey, you can, some of you are speaking in tongues because you want everyone to look at you and say, oh my gosh, how, look at that person. Look how spiritual they are. And, and, and so that's a sign of being manipulated by the flesh. And, and guys, these are those things that we fall prey to. This is why people throughout the years in churches have arguments, st stories have their, their war, churches have their war stories of, of, you know, what's gone on in church conferences and church business meetings and what's gone, gone on in parking lots and Sunday school classes of people arguing with, with each other, which spiritually mature people argue with each other. Verb. Oh, they would not. Can spiritually mature people disagree? Sure. But would they argue? No. Spiritual infants argue. Spiritually mature people figure it out. Spiritually mature people say, because they're not manipulated by the flesh, so they're not out for their own gain, spiritually mature people say, help me understand what you're saying. And let's see if we can get to the same place. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what you're saying. Let's see if we can get to the same place. And hey guys, listen. I don't claim to have been a master of that all my life. I don't claim to have been a master of that in my whole time here as your pastor. But I hope to be growing in it. Hopefully I have been growing in it. Hopefully there are witnesses to that. I see witnesses of you growing in it. I, I see testimony and evidence of you growing in it. Absolutely. But we're not at a finishing point. This is something that, that continues. This is where we continue to grow and mature and lessen the impact and control of the flesh, the manipulation of the flesh in our lives as we continue to grow as, as individuals and as a church and, and mature in, in, in these areas. We see that the spiritual infant is also focused on man. Verse four, for when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? Verse 5, what then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So he, Paul here goes back to this idea that he introduced, as I told you, in chapter 1, that we talked about a few weeks ago. He, and he's pointing out these spiritual infants, the Corinthians acting like spiritual infants. One of the signs of this is that they're focused on men. They're focused on, on, who's, on who baptized who. I was baptized by Apollos. I was uh, baptized by Paul. And therefore, that, that makes me have more control over me. They're, they're fighting over who, who had control based on who had baptized them. They even threw, Paul even threw Cephas in there in, in chapter 1, you remember. So there, there was this, this division going on because the people were focused on the men who baptized them. They, 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 were, they were focused on the evangelists. They, they were focused on, on the one who brought the message. Not on the one who is the message. And, and, and that's, the, that's the problem that, that Paul was pointing out to the Corinthians. Hey, th does it matter that, that these men surrendered to God and, and surrendered to his will and, and, and were obedient to God's will and brought them the message and were missionaries and church planters and Sunday school teachers, if you will? Does it matter that they were obedient to that? Absolutely it does. Is that something to be applauded? Is that something to be, to be looked upon as a good thing? Absolutely it is. Absolutely we should, we should look and, and see that there have been faithful preachers and faithful missionaries and, and, and faithful teachers and faithful music leaders and, and faithful servants of the church. <coughs> should we look at that and should we apply? Absolutely we should do that. But should we put our faith in them? No. We don't put our faith in these faithful people. We put our faith in the one that they have faith in. We put our faith in the one that they are pointing us to. You see, the, the, the problem with men, with humanity, with people, is that people will fail us. 
people will disappoint us. You ever been disappointed by anyone? Sure. You ever been disappointed by your pastor? I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. And, and, and you see, the, the, the problem then with being a follower of, of men, of, of people, of evangelists, of preachers, of pastors, well, I go to, you know, there's an issue. There's an issue when you say, oh, yeah, I go to Lewis Papers Church. Please don't ever say that. Please don't. It, it, it's not mine. I, you, you can say, I go to God's church in New Bethel where Lewis Baker's the pastor. That's cool. But don't, don't say it, it's, it's mine. Please don't. Don't say you go to any other person's church. It's God's church. It's God's church. Because, as I was getting to, the, 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 the problem then with following men and saying, I go to this person's church or I go to that person's church and being a follower of, of this pastor or this missionary or this teacher or that teacher or whatever, is that when they fail you, when the people fail you, when the people disappoint you, who are you going to turn on? Who are you going to turn away from? You're not just going to turn away from... If, if Louis Baber fails you, if Louis Baber disappoints you, nine times out of ten, people aren't just going to say, well, I'm going to find a, a different church because <coughs> Louis failed me. You know what happens most of the time? People just stop going to church. People turn away from Jesus because a person has, who they had put their faith in disappointed them or failed them. And, and, and that's a problem. You see, when I have my faith and trust in Jesus, when I'm looking to him, when I'm looking to him as, as the one who is the standard, I will never be disappointed in him. I'll never be disappointed in him. He can't do it. He won't fail me. So, so don't follow mere men. Don't, don't, get, don't get puffed up on, on who baptized you or, or who's preaching you like the best or, or, or this or that. Be puffed up on God. Be puffed up on Him. And, and that's the, 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 the final idea that, that's communicated in the passage that we, that we study today. I, I thought about Concluding this at, at verse 4 and picking up next time uh, beyond that. But <coughs> wanted to kind of end more of a, of a high note. Okay? And, and so as you look at verses 5 through 7, we already read verse 5, some of it. But the, the idea is that the only way that, and, and we want to end on this, the, the, the way that I, if, if I identify myself as a spiritual infant, if, if, I, if I go through what we've, what we've gone through today, if I, talk, if, I, if I examine myself and say, boy, if, are these characteristics, are these traits true in me? Then I need to know, what do I do about it? How, how, do, I, how do I shake from the ruts of being a spiritual infant when I'm supposed to be <coughs> maturing spiritually? How do I get shaken from that? How do I move out of that and move to this place of maturity? And, and we see that, I mean, you know, it may seem like a a sin, I guess it kind of is a simple answer. <laughs> but, but the way that I move through that, the way that I move from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity is by trusting God. It's by recognizing God. By acknowledging that it's God who moves me. God who grows me. God who changes me. And that's the, that's the language that, that he uses here. Verse 5, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. When our focus is on God, we recognize our place. And this helps us to grow. We recognize our place. Paul recognizes here, and he, and he refers to himself and Apollos as servants. When we recognize our place of humility, and we recognize our place as servants, then we start to move. But you see, the spiritual infant, an infant is not about humility, and an infant is not about serving anybody. An infant is about getting what I need, getting what I want right now. An infant is about feed me, change me. But you see, what, what, what the language that Paul uses here, that when you want, you want to grow, and if you are growing, guess what you recognize? You recognize 
that I need to be humble and I need to recognize my place as a servant. As a servant. And recognize that, that the Lord is the one who gives me the opportunity to be in this place. To be in this position. The Lord is the one who has put me in this position of being a spiritual man as opposed to a natural man in the first place. It's he who's done it. I haven't put myself here through any grand uh, understanding, any grand intellect that I have. God has put me here in this place. God has put me in this position to be a spiritual man is what you need to be thinking. He says, I planted a pile of water, but God was causing the growth. One of the other things that, that we understand to, to be in this place to grow is to recognize our role, recognize our spiritual gifting. He says, I planted Apollos water. What had God gifted Paul to do? What had God gifted Apollos to do? You want to grow? Understand. Seek out the answers to how it is that God has gifted you. And then grow that way. Allow him to grow you that way. Understand your role and use the gifts that God has given you. And then understand that ultimately it's God causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. You find yourself as a spiritual infant. Find that this is not where you need to stay, not where you need to be. Then you open yourself to God and say, God, grow me. Father, will you grow me? Father, will you show me how to be in the position so that you can grow me? Father, will you help me to listen to, to, the, to the signs around me, to the people around me? And here's another thing. As a church family, we have to be in a position and we have to recognize that, one, I need to receive encouragement to grow from others. Maybe, maybe, maybe one of my brothers and sisters in Christ sees that I'm stuck. Sees that, that I'm, I'm, I'm in a place that I shouldn't be in. That, that, I'm, that I'm not growing and maturing as I should be. I, and and, and when, when, when my brother or sister in Christ delivers that message to me then, as a loving brother or sister in Christ, then I should be able to hear it. And receive it. When my brother or sister in Christ says, hey, I, I got a discipleship study that's going on. Will you be a part of it? I need to consider that. Too many times people readily dismiss invitations like that. No, I don't do that. I don't do Bible study. I don't do discipleship study. I come to church on Sunday at 11 o'clock. That's what I do. God hasn't called me to grow. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. That is his expectation. I think if you if, if you if you don't walk out of here with anything else today, walk out of here with this understanding that clearly the expectation in these verses that we've studied today, the expectation is that we are to be growing. The expectation that's, is that spiritual infancy is not an end goal. Spiritual infancy is a beginning that we should quickly want to grow from. If you find that you've been, a, if, you, if you're, you're, you're sitting here and you're examining yourself, and you find that, hey, I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years, but these things that we've talked about, that applies to me, man, quickly, quickly make yourself available to God to grow. <coughs> quickly look to change these behaviors. Because not only does it impact you, but it impacts God's church. And folks, if we think that God's church in particular, in, in, in general, that God's church in general is having the impact that it ought to be having on the world around us, then we're sadly mistaken. And a big reason for that, a big reason that God's church is not having the global impact, the local impact, any impact that it should be having, is that the church is filled with spiritual infants. I'm not standing here today questioning anyone's salvation. That's not for me to do. That's for you to do. You judge your own salvation. You judge where you are with God. But the fact is that as we judge, we need to judge ourselves honestly. We need to evaluate ourselves honestly. 
and recognize that not only does my evaluation impact me, but it impacts God's church for the future. Because if the church continues to be filled with spiritual infants, guess what it will not be filled with in the future? It won't even be filled with spiritual infants. It won't be filled with anybody. Because as a spiritual infant only cares about himself, how will we multiply? How will we grow? We often wonder. We, we, we look around and we wonder, why? You know, why are more people in church? Why, why don't more people come to church? That, you know, 30,000 people drive by here every day. They know we're here. Why don't they come? Perhaps the answer lies in us. Perhaps the answer as to why more people don't come. And you say, well, I'm not responsible for them. What do you sound like? Spiritual infant. Is it really my responsibility to be a witness to them? Is it really my responsibility to think about them? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But guess what? It starts with you. You can still think about yourself. You can still think about yourself in as much as you are evaluating how do I get out of this hole of being a spiritual infant? How do I get out of this place? How do I grow out of this place of being a spiritual infant and grow into the spiritual man, the spiritual woman that God intends for me to be? And, 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 and get this. God doesn't hope that you'll be. It's not, a, it's not a dream and a wish that he has. Out of it. it is his expectation that you and I are maturing spiritually. Do not settle, friends. We cannot settle for where we are, for being where we are. And, that, and that's even to those who are spiritually mature. Perhaps, perhaps you're at a place where you think, you look at this stuff and say, well, yeah, that, that's not me most of the time. I'm at a mature place. But are you fully mature? No one, no one here can say that. And, and, and I can with confidence say that. No one here can say that I am fully mature. So every one of us, as we examine ourselves in light of what we've studied today, should be in this place of saying, Lord, how can you grow me? How will you grow me? How can I be in a place so that you can grow me best? It's a question that every single one of us should be asking. And the answer that every single one of us should be looking for as we leave this place today. Do not, do not, I challenge you. You cannot walk out of here today thinking that there's nothing here for me today. You cannot walk out of here thinking that there's nothing in the scripture that applies to me you cannot. If you do, I feel for you. I feel for you. Because I if, if you walk out of here thinking that there's nothing for you today, I, I, I do question whether or not you're even a spiritual infant. Maybe you are still a natural man. But every single one of us has to consider how this applies to us. Read the scripture. Study the scripture. Let this scripture that we've studied today, these verses that we've studied today, shape and inform your plan for spiritual maturity. You must examine the plan that, that God has for your spiritual maturity. And trust me, he has one. Your church can be a part of it, should be a part of it, wants to be a part of it. But you have to examine and you have to know and you have to go for it. You have to be intentional about seeking out this plan for spiritual maturity because God's expectation is that you will grow. The only spiritual infants that are allowed here, that should be allowed here, are the ones who really are spiritual infants. That's it. That's it. So we have to examine ourselves, but as brothers and sisters, we have to look at each other and say, brother, how can I help you grow? Sister, how can I help you grow? How can you, sister, brother, will you help me grow? These are the mindsets, the attitudes, the questions that we should be asking. Let's pray.
Father, thank you so much that you have a plan for our growth. Thank you so much that in our spiritual infancy, when we're supposed to be there, you have a plan and a design and a desire that we, that we grow from that, that we mature. Father, I'm grateful that we can see that there's a plan, that there's a desire for us to grow. Father, I, I, I pray that as we search ourselves and if we find ourselves stuck in this place of infancy, that we'll have courage to say, I don't want to be stuck in this place. Courage to say, I recognize that I'm stuck, that I've been stuck in this place, and it's time to change that. No matter what people might say, no matter what people might think. God, I pray that there, there will be a burning desire on every person's heart here, every person who, who, who listens to this sermon online, Father, I, I pray that there will be a burning desire in each of our hearts, a driving desire in each of our hearts to grow continuously for all of our lives, for all the days of our lives, to grow continuously in our spiritual maturity, never settling for anything less than continuous growth. Father, I pray that you move among your people here today to do just that.